everyone, and welcome to our show Voidcast. I'm your host for today, Lenny, and with me is my friend and co-host, Carlos. Hey, hello, everyone. This is the ninth episode, and today we are going to speak with our special guest, Mark J. Maharaj, also known as Question Mark on YouTube, about his past and ongoing projects, his experience with the antenatalist community, if there even is such a thing, and the lessons learned along the way. Welcome, Mark, and thanks for being with us today. Greetings. Now, just a quick reminder before we get on with the show, you know this already, you are probably listening to us on YouTube right now, which is fine, but you can also, if you so prefer, check us out on other podcast platforms. Just go to our link tree at linktr.ee slash vegan voidcast. Now, over the past couple of months, we, Carlos and I, appeared on uh, a number of other channels, both as the Voidcast duo and individually. And I think now it's about time to kind of return the favor and have other voices on our channel as well. And also discuss, uh, have interesting discussions and also hear what they have to say, you know, the criticisms they would like to voice. Now, um, Mark, I'm sure a lot of our listeners uh, are already aware of who you are. But nevertheless, I think it makes sense to you know, start with a brief introduction to yourself and your antenatalist journey. So would you tell us a bit more about how you came to antenatalism? Sure. Uh, I actually doubt a lot of people know about me, but um, okay. Uh, so around mm, 2012, 2013, I was part of this uh, local group of uh, atheists and skeptics. This is around the, if people remember the YouTube thing about uh, the new atheists. And I was mm -hmm. looking for mm -hmm. uh, a local group where people can con congregate and talk about uh, atheism, skepticism, and critical thinking, stuff like that. And so I found this group, and I uh, we met every week. And we uh, every week we would have different topics of debate and discussion. And eventually, there was one vegan in the group. And I prior to... Uh, uh, I always had a, a negative view of... Uh, veganism and vegans uh and but eventually i was like well if this is a ridiculous idea let's 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 debate it in let's in you know in a fashion and it turns out uh the more i brought that up in the meeting with uh people that i respected uh that i i think that you know i had high um, high expectations and uh, it started off as like let's make fun of veganism and and uh, vegan arguments but the more i brought up the that type of stuff i uh it it turned out we like it kept stumping people uh it was it was the marginal cases uh argument without actually knowing about the argument uh trying to d understand why we discriminate treatment uh based on species membership and without other moral characteristics and anyway uh, about three months of debating uh that topic in a friendly debate and friendly discussion uh one of my friends uh who's not a vegan said mark if you if you see this as a rational position. I said, well, it's not whether or not I see it as a rational position. It's like, do you have a counter argument? And they said, like, it wouldn't happen. Um, they said, well, why don't you go vegan? And I'm like, you're, you're right. Maybe I will. And so actually how I got, how I turned vegan was by trying to debunk it. And then the non-vegan told me to go vegan. So after that happened, I got involved in the animal, uh, the vegan world uh, locally. And uh, that was a little bit of a, a weird uh, environment to go from people who are more philosophy, uh, science oriented to, there's, there tends to be, at the time anyway, I don't know what it's like now, uh, more pseudoscience within the, or, or new age woo within that that community, um, at least at the time, anecdotally within my, you know, this is my own personal experience. So it was a little bit of a weird shift. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I noticed that there were health vegans, there were environmental vegans, and then how do you even define vegan, which is kind of like the whole, how do you define antinatalism shtick. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually I found my little group that kind of aligned with my views with the animal rights people. Uh, they seem to have been taking it more of a, as an ethical position. We were talking about the moral relevancy of, of, of sentient beings, and that's where I fell into. So I started doing animal rights activism, and then... Uh, through that, I, I had a great time doing that. I loved the discussions, the debates. It was mostly friendly. I did get some, you know, pushback like any activist would. Um, one thing that bothered me through a lot of after demos is the positive uh, congratulations we we said to each other, where it was like, 
we did this action. We saved so many animals today. And I was like, did we? Like, I just sent, I just, I just had a few conversations and just sent out some pamphlets. Like, how did I save anybody? Um, what, uh, and that got into the discussion about the difference between um, advocating on behalf of, of someone and then also direct action of actually saving someone. And later on, there was, uh, I, I thought about it more that I wasn't helping someone that already exists. I wasn't helping an animal that already exists. I was sparing animals from coming into existence that, I, that as a ethic, regardless of how you situate the good, um, we're arguing that it is good. Uh, and if that's the case, then why was I saying that this is good for certain animals, but not for, uh, say, a human animal? And mm. I think now you know how I got down to, to the road mm -hmm. of of antinatalism. And then I got introduced to the work of Benatar and then the uh, YouTube antinatalism world and uh, a lot of articles on the topic. And I've really been into more of the academic side of antinatalism. But for me, it was always about the ethics of uh, moral agents creating moral uh, subjects or moral patients into existence. And that to me, that was, has always been the focus that's uh, correlated with animal ethics and uh, antinatalism ethics. I, ho I hope that made some sense. So that's how I, my journey to it. And I, I joined the Facebook group and eventually I was looking for a community and started, uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm the first one, but I remember in 2014 or 15, I think it was, no, no, it was 2017, um, uh, making an in-person regular antinatalism meetup. And uh, like had on meetup.com. And I think the first meeting had about nine people or something like that uh, and continued that. And then um, hosted uh, monthly Zoom meetings for people within the community. And then eventually I asked in the Facebook group, is, is there an antinatalism podcast? And there was talk about some people trying to start it, but there was not many, not much interest. So I was like, all right, well, I connected with a, a fellow YouTuber, um, her name was Kirby and she helped start like a fundraiser. And this was a fundraiser, not just for the podcast, but for community uh, building. Cause I had a history of that. And um, we were like a little bit of a team back then. And then um, we were generating things for like a website and monthly meetups and in-person meetups and yeah, the podcast. And then I was like Nick Fury uh, where I went into Twitter and discords, different discords and Facebook and, and you name it. I was trying to look for people interested in starting this project. And uh, Carlos was uh, one of the people to join the team and uh, yeah, got a team together. Uh, and then we released the first episode. Uh, you could probably tell I was super nervous in that episode. Uh, but <laughs> that, that, that was my first podcast ever as well. Yeah, I heard in one of like the interviews, you're like, oh yeah, there was two podcasts I was on. I was like, no, you were, you were on another one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, here's the thing. I could not have got got it going. So like, it was probably like my brainchild, but it was talked about by other people as well who wanted to start things like that, but lack of interest. But I couldn't have got it going without the team. So it was definitely a team project. So I take, people probably don't know uh, some of that back history. And I, I'm i not very good at self-promotion, but it's, it's like, because honestly, like I couldn't do it without the team. So um, I'm grateful for everybody's help in starting that. And uh, yeah, did that for two years and retired. And now I'm sort of back. I don't know what I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm in the space, but uh, I'm not really, you know, doing much now. All right. <laughs> I, I tried to give a quick summary as best as I could. Yeah, no, I think that was uh, fascinating. And we're going to cover like some of your um, past and ongoing projects uh, later on. Um, but first, just a quick question. Would you say that you actually came to antinatalism or kind of reached the antinatalist conclusion through sincere ethical reflection because most perhaps not most but many people at least seem to have some sort of disposition towards it and uh, a lot of people uh, say well i've always been an antinatalist and now i discovered that there is even a term for it um or i don't know certain um uh, certain beliefs or people were not going to have uh, children anyway and then found this position that conveniently uh, aligned with their um, Kind of, kind of with with their lifestyle anyway, but would you say that uh, you are one of the rare cases where it's really down to to ethical reflection? So this is something that I try to keep in mind because um, at the time, it. So I have I have. There's a there are times obviously in my life where I go through certain emotional struggles, and I could definitely see the like a motivated reasoning or a post hoc rationalization to getting to a conclusion. Um, 
I, so with all my, with a lot of my ethical beliefs, I'm pretty confident about some of them not being motivated by that because it actually brought more harm or more uh, uh, problems in my life. For example, like the vegan thing. Um, I think some people get, they see benefit, they get a community, they get a sense of identity, they get, there's a lot of benefits to it. I lost friends just by my existence. I, did, I wasn't fighting with anybody. I wasn't arguing with anybody. Just, just, just being vegan was, was enough to make people uncomfortable. And un so I was like, but I have to, in principle, if this is really what I believe, I'm going to stick to it. And then when I thought about the goodness of not bringing uh, at least farmed animals to create them as a moral agent, to create them into existence. Yeah. It, it followed logically to, to get that to the human species. And I don't have any like hate for kids or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm, like I would adopt if I could, or if or maybe in the future I will, uh, with the right partner, if that ever happens. But like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not like motivated by a uh, disdain for kids or anything like that. Uh, the one thing that I do try to keep in mind is like having a, a, a philosophical pessimistic, uh, look on existence and whether or not that sort of motivates me to get to antinatalism. Mm -hmm. Um, but for the most part, yeah, I, if any of this, um, uh, these values uh, cr like crumble or any of the logic crumbles or the reasoning crumbles, then I would just change my mind on, on antinatalism. But so far it hasn't. And it's kind of like the animal ethics stuff. It, it hasn't. Um, and so uh, I, I don't want to say like I was a pure calculating robot. Like I was definitely motivated by intuitions of what I value and that those intuitions of what I value uh, led me to uh, animal ethics and antinatalism. Yeah. Speaking about your own personal approach and interpretation of antinatalism, in one of our private conversations, which I, by the way, really appreciate, uh, you called yourself, I quote, an agent, relative, sentiocentric, planetarian, philanthropic focused, non consequentialist, antinatalist. And could we, could, could we perhaps go through this uh, very long description and, you know, break it down and uh, explain your, uh, like your, uh, your perspective? So, what do you mean by agent relative? Yes, yeah, I'm glad that you appreciated that, uh, my little word salad. Here. <laughs> I, I also want to find out if I'm one of them, if I fulfill all these, all these criteria. So, because I think I, think I do, but uh, yeah, let's, me let's too. See. <laughs> me too. As in my own head, as I break down all these specific terms and, and, and hyphenated words, I, I go, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I want to hear Mark's uh, explanation. So the stage is yours, Mark. <laughs> okay. So, all right, let's, uh, so again, agent relative, sentiocentric, Benetarian, philanthropic focus, non-consequentialist, antinatalism. All right, so the agent relative part came from many years of having discussions with people about sentiocentric antinatalism and people lumping me into a group that says they have a positive duty to mm -hmm. uh, interject into wild animal suffering or to, where I think it's super auditory, which is like, it's good, but it's not a positive duty, which yeah. th there's a difference there. And so why is there a difference? And it, when it comes to the ethical uh ethical conclusion of antinatalism i'm saying that this antinatalism is a an ethical stance for agents for moral agents so moral agents to me should not be generating or creating into existence moral uh morally relevant persons into uh, into this existence so that would be agent relative so this is this is focused on the agents not necessarily a two rabbits you know uh procreate i'm not saying that they're uh they're unethical like i i just wouldn't be able to conceptualize that um so so that differentiates me from some of the sentiocentric uh antinatalists who, who posit that there is a positive duty to interject uh and that uh and and it's a it might be a very splitting hairs kind of thing because i do think it's a good if you to be um that there are some some small in, uh things that we can do for example there's a project here that uh, they put um, like rabies, anti-rabies uh, medication into the, the forests, and then it helps reduce the the, po the, the disease uh, within uh, those populations. I'm like, that's an intervention that I think is good. It's 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 helping out everybody. It's helping out animals. We're good. It's a uh, but to say that I have a positive duty to to sterilize all animals or something like that, I, I'm like, th th that's not my, that's not where I'm coming from. Um, and uh, so so my view of antinatalism is that it's an ethical thing re relative or related to moral agents creating moral subjects or moral patients and uh the benetarian thing is uh um, well there's sorry, sorry sorry go ahead can i i mean uh can i chime in here yeah, yeah of course so um yeah i 
I would agree with that. Um, so in the context of antinatalism and its very limited scope, we're talking about negative values and we're talking about negative duties and yeah. not to create not to create another human or not you know to create another morally relevant uh, patient um is one thing but to go out and prevent non-existent beings from coming into existence is not just one logical step ahead or something it's it's a completely different um uh, completely different uh, area of ethics and this does not mean that uh, uh, people like uh, you and I don't care about uh, wild animals. I mean, Carlos even does uh, his hunts having. And I do think that uh, the well-being of wild animals is indeed uh, important, but must be considered separately, not uh, within antinatalism. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. In my case, uh, I justify the hunt sabbing because I'm preventing other humans from doing harm. Yeah. I, I would not go out and hunt sab a fox hunting a rodent, for example. If you know what I mean. Yeah. 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 And uh, um, all right. Do you want to move on to yeah, Benetarian? So, yeah, Benetarian. So you, are, yeah, you are a hardcore Benetarian, aren't you? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a sense, okay, listen. So there, he's written about other things. I'm So here's this, here's the problem with using that term Benetarian, because then people can lump you into like, he's written about other topics that I disagree with mm -hmm. him on and politics and stuff like that. That doesn't necessarily, so when people hear Benetarian, I'm a hardcore Benetarian, like, in, in this specific area, when it comes to procreative ethics, a lot of his arguments to lead to the Antonellis conclusion, um, I'm in agreement with. Um, I am not as confident about the quality of life argument. However, I think that with the risk argument that that leads me to the Antonellis conclusion. And um, but overall, my main my main uh, sway to antinatalism is a Benetarian analysis of creating into existence. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's interesting because for me. Um, I mean, I agree with your assessment of uh, Benatar and his uh, other like, unrelated uh, views. And his position on antinatalism and on pessimism in general is one that I share. However, I, over, the, over the years, I came to appreciate his uh, writing style more than I appreciate the, the arguments themselves, if you, if you know what I mean. So I think that... Um, yeah, I love the way that he writes, yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of uh, other arguments that one can make in, in favor of um, antinatalism, perhaps even in favor of uh, veganism. Um, but nonetheless, the position is uh, is the one that uh, I would say I'd sub I subscribe to as well. Yeah, and of course, like there's Cabrera and there's there's yeah. other people presenting arguments. So I think one thing that um, I'm assuming, well, I, I don't know how well known it is. Uh, I think Benatar gets uh, highlighted maybe a little too much sometimes mm -hmm. as like this is antinatalism and it's not it's he's presenting his argument for antinatalism and there are other people who have presented arguments too so that's why i think i, I added that in there uh so this is where mm -hmm. i'm sort of more swayed but also acknowledging all the other people who also present arguments too yeah unfortunately every argument that enters into the wider uh, let's call it marketplace of ideas inevitably uh needs to be kind of uh, pared down to its base essentials bare essentials and at the same time have some sort of um author you know you, you, so people can go okay antinatalism yes we need we need to find somebody who embodies this term in in some fashion um and then you know things get too simple and and you know you lose the nuance and and i think benatar one way or another for better or for worse has been like the well not not the face because he doesn't show his face but he's been like the the the, the representative of antinatalism whether he wants to or not just because of using that term on that book yeah i don't think he inter interjected himself to be like no it's not his fault yeah, yeah. I don't think it's his fault yeah yeah i would even say it's an accomplishment uh, to establish this very weird and to many people unintuitive position as something that is indeed worth um considering and worth taking seriously in academic philosophy so um, then we move on to philanthropic focused. Yeah, so I, I use this term because I wanted to, um, I used to go uh, say that I was a philanthropic antinatalist, but there was this, uh, a lot of people would push back with saying like, um, the two aren't mutually exclusive, philanthropic and misanthropic. Like you can have both and you can hold those two mm -hmm. views. And I acknowledge the harms that uh, happen when, not just to the being, but also what the being does to others as well. Um, and so, but my focus is on the the philanthropic uh, nature uh, of, of of like for me, it, like my thing is that I'm I really um, 
I don't know, I don't know the right word for it, but my main focus is on the being and the suffering that they will, they will uh, be at, at, put at risk of and their, yeah, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, that, that's, um, it's a philanthropic focused antinatalism for me, um, but acknowledging the misanthropic as well. Yeah, I get what you mean. And I personally think that the terms misanthropic and philanthropic are a bit misleading uh, in antinatalist uh, discourse. First of all, as you said, because they're not uh, mutually exclusive and misanthropic does not have to do anything with hating humans, right. yeah. uh, as the etymology would imply, that it's simply looking at the harms that the one being brought into existence, which doesn't even have to be a human, uh, would inevitably cause to, to others. So sometimes I find myself using uh, the term patient-focused uh, or something like that uh, instead okay. Yeah. Okay, like that. So, for, for philanthropic. Now, you call yourself a non-consequentialist antinatalist, and this is something that I find really refreshing because uh, much of uh, antinatalist discourse is kind of uh, shaped by, by utilitarian rhetoric. So um, can you elaborate on that? So anecdotally, when it comes to the antinatalist sphere or space, I, I kind of am reticent about calling it a community, but it's definitely a space and you should be in it and in person too. And given the spaces that I've been involved in, especially when you covered Emil Torres, that like that's the world that I came from, which is mm -hmm. predominantly uh, consequentialist uh, dominant. And um, yeah, I, in discourse, I found... Uh, I came across more consequentialists than non-consequentialists. And it did feel kind of lonely at times, but I knew like there would always be a few, a few uh, uh, non-consequential. And I think for the general public, they are non-consequentialists. It's just they haven't uh, like evaluated their, um, to, to, to like uh, their normative ethics of how they're, which one they would quote, go into. And I call it non-consequentialist because I haven't actually figured out what non-consequentialism version I actually subscribe to in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was a negative utilitarian for about seven or eight years, something like that. So it was quite a shift and it happened during the show. Uh, so like there are some episodes where I am, you know, talking about negative utilitarian and then eventually you could hear that uh, I've changed my, changed my view on that. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's hard to get a gauge of the population in antinatalism because I have a, a bit of a selection uh, bias because I stick to the, essentially the nerds in antinatalism and uh mm -hmm. I've, I've ventured off into other areas of antinatalism spaces and it scares me. So I, I go back into my little uh, philosophy cave. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about that uh, as well. Um, but just, just a quick question. Um, your channel description reads that you're interested in antinatalism, population ethics, veganism, effective altruism, existential risk, transhumanism, abortion and atheism. But I find no mention of philosophical pessimism. So <laughs> would you describe yourself as a philosophical pessimist? Uh, yes, but it's, um, it's, uh, I hold that provisionally. If new information could come out where, uh, that would sway me to something else. I mean, a lot of my beliefs are held that way. I'm not convinced by actually, like I, I say I'm a soft philosophical pessimist. I, I don't think, uh, I don't think I'm as hard as like, like, I don't accept, um, like that Schopenhauer view of, uh, there, what was it? There's no, like, uh, pleasures that are not uh alleviation of deprivations or something like that and mm -hmm. um I, I don't i don't view it that way and when it comes to the progress of societies or 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 the world like i, I don't know if it's going to be positive or negative um so i'm kind of uh I'm not i'm not as uh i don't know about that as much um some of the metaphysical claims and ontological claims i'm still evaluating myself so I'm I'm just not as confident uh, with the philosophical pessimism thing because you know there are many philosophical pessimist philosophers and they have different uh, views and uh, yeah okay thank you well uh, don't push back on me with that because I know you are uh, you definitely subscribe to that right I mean yeah it's uh, Carlos and I I think both uh, would describe ourselves as you know being pessimists philosophical pessimists and we both have a great passion for um, not only for philosophical pessimism but also for artistic uh, um, representation of that, yeah. yeah of that pessimism so it's definitely something that i find very fascinating and that um it kind of aligns with how i view the world yeah so, so this is so you asked me about antinatalism about like how i my motivations to getting there when it comes to philosophical pessimism this is the one where i'm very worried that in my dark uh, stages where i'm like i'm being drawn to this I don't know if it's because of the logic or the, uh, or the analysis, uh, 
like uh, socially or or the empirical data shows certain trends. Like I had, like I'm I'm much more skeptical. And uh, even though right now, if you ask me if I'm a philosophical philosophical, yes, I am. But uh, I would say a soft one because I need to do more um, analysis of it before I can be more confident about it. But this is one when it comes to like motivated reason. This is this is the one that I'm like, I got to be careful that I'm not just because of certain phases of my life that I'm more drawn to it than uh, I should be or shouldn't be. So I want to make sure that even in great stages of my life that I'm still like, yes, this is a this is the worldview that I'm going down, you know? Okay, I see. But um, would you say um, that the antinatalist position is necessarily tied to some sort of pessimistic diagnosis of, you know, of life, of the world? Because for me, it seems like you can't just decouple these two. Um, I'm going to say yes, but I'm also skeptical of that too. Okay. So I do, I do, I do agree with you, but I could, like, I, I'm playing with the idea that that's, that it could be decoupled. I don't have a, I don't have a good argument for that. I'm just, yeah, I've, I've been, I've been talking to other anti-natalists about this and seeing what their views are. And I've talked to you about it. I talked to that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's just something I'm, I'm open to, I guess, but for now, yes, I agree. <laughs> Did you want to like expand about that a little bit more for you in particular? Because I'd like to, <laughs> and and also I, Carlos, like because like you both you you read the my little word salad there, but like what are your views on that? When someone wants to solve an ethical problem with a calculator, <laughs> they find that I do find that a bit uh, a bit amusing at times. And my own views, I'm I'm more on the non consequentialist side of things, even though certain utilitarian arguments also. Um, appeal to me, but you know, I grew up with uh, Stoic philosophy, so so uh, more of a um, virtue uh, virtue ethics uh, focus, and I was I was never really able to to shake that completely to 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 get rid of this uh, perspective. So at the end of the day, this is kind of still where I you know see myself on that uh, on that spectrum. And uh, interestingly, once you take this. Uh, yeah, it's essentially a virtue of Ahimsa, of not uh, causing violence um, into account. Then you will find that, at least for me, that um, many of the views that I hold kind of point towards uh, the the negative or some kind of negative utilitarian uh, standpoint. Even though I come from from a different uh, perspective, but of course, you know, not uh, causing uh, violence and not you know creating harm. I think. Uh, Uh, things like like veganism uh, makes sense from both from both perspectives, and uh, yeah. But I'm like I'm still still exploring uh, the options. But generally, I'm more like I, f I find the non consequentialist uh, arguments uh, like more more intriguing and uh, perhaps even uh, even stronger. All things considered. Okay. Yeah. Come yeah. I, I I would tend to say the same thing regarding. Um, let's say the non consequentialist is what I aspire to. Uh, but I think I have like a lot of people, I would say maybe the majority of people, like a very consequentialist brain <laughs> in terms of also things related to my, let's say, pers you know, choices I make in my own life. Yeah. But then, um, but then, you know, in terms of kind of intellectually and, and, and when I read and reflect, definitely non-consequentialist. Although I, I have to, to be honest, I, I don't spend a lot of time labeling myself. Although, although I think labels are useful when you're starting conversations like this, but I don't uh, yeah, often kind of like a guide. Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a sense, it it is a, it is an ethical guide for kind of decision making. Um, but but also, you know, a lot of things related to antinatal. I mean, we've discussed this in the podcast before, but you know, antinatalism by itself is not a guide. It's only a guide for a very small part of human exist of the typical human existence. So, right. but overall, like, all the other terms in there, what do you, like, how do you feel about the the word salad there? It describes my own position very well and accurately, I would say. I personally would not use the Benetarian one because yeah. it's it it. I, I don't think it's necessary. I think it kind of subsumed mm. by the other ones. I mean, for people who know, they know uh, right. it's subsumed by the other ones, and then it it kind of it's the it's the only one that refers to an actual author. True. Um, and and as you said, you you might get uh, associated with things you don't want to be associate, associated with. Yeah. Yeah, that's the only, that's the only one I would, I would take out. I'll keep the other ones and you kind of do it. The, the other ones are already doing that job, in my opinion. Sure, thanks, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a bit redundant, yeah. So uh, as, we, as you mentioned earlier, you used to be part 
of a certain podcast. You used to be part of the Exploring Antinatalism um, podcast, which has now, you know, become a bit of a one uh, one person project. But back in the day, a lot of uh, other people used to be involved in that uh, as well, including you, including Carlos. So I think this might be a good opportunity to to give some credit to the original crew, because I feel this is uh, maybe a bit uh, kind of a forgotten part of, of the online internatalist uh, history. So um, would you like to tell us a bit more of um, how it came into being and how it was uh, how it got started? Yeah, we're going back a few years. Um, so yeah, I did a little bit of digging because, uh, like, I don't I don't stay on social media too long, but I, I was able to find some old messages where I was. Um, I remember uh, when I entered the antinatalist world, I I saw a lot of opportunity for growth and community building because I, I I talked to a lot of people where they. Um, didn't have a lot of connections or a lot of support. And I was like, well, we could do this. We could support each other and we could work together as a team and uh, create something that may inspire something else in the future. And uh, and at the time, um, yeah, I was just asking questions of like, how, how, are there in-person meetups? Are there uh, monthly meetups uh, that we could discuss and debate and um, connect with one another and explore ideas together. And I was, it was a thirst that I had at the time. Um, and I really wanted to engage with other antinatalists uh, about these topics. And yeah, eventually I, I asked a bunch of questions uh, and said, is anybody doing this? And there was talk about it. And I said, all right, well, I'll, I don't know how to do it, but I'll gather a bunch of people together and see what, what can happen. And uh, I was, I was like, uh, you get a bunch of brains together. Like, even if I don't know how to do something, well, if we get a, a bunch of people together, then at least we could try to figure it out. And um, yeah. And, and, and that's how it got started. I, uh, I didn't know a lot of people that well at the time. I remember, I didn't know Carlos. I remember I went, I forgot which discord server it was, but it was with uh, 10 of spades. And then I remember both of you jumped on, as soon as I asked it, I was like, is anybody interested? And both of you were like, yes, let's do this. I was like, okay. Um, and yeah, like, uh, yeah, that's how that, that's how it got started. We, we had, a, I think, weekly meetings, a few weekly, and then just um, figured out a, an overall blueprint. And I, I remember um, making a poll, uh, pe asking people, what would you like the name of the podcast uh, and the aesthetic and the music and all the other elements of, of creating a show, which I had no experience. And um, thankfully, there was someone that uh, knew how to do audio editing and stuff like that. So uh, everyone brought different skills to the team um, and was very uh, passionate and motivated to get it going. And um, yeah, and, and that's how it got started. And uh, I, I would be curious about uh, Carlos's perspective because uh, it's been, what, four years? Or, I, no, it's, I forget how many years it was. It was. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't. I don't know what it was like for me. It was sort of a lockdown project, wasn't it, for a lot of people? Yeah, yeah. Like this is the kind of feel of a lockdown project, right when the pandemic was coming, right? So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think what I remember seems to align with what you're remembering. We had regular meetings. Um, we, I think, there was a lot of things we didn't do correctly. Like there was no way to resolve conflicts that we had agreed on. On there was no kind of real remit for people in roles. And it was kind of just, you know, just a bunch of people trying to get on, first of all, and then kind of produce a podcast. Um, but um, it, it wasn't very clear who was doing what and and who was deciding and who owned it or didn't own it. So everybody kind of owned it, yeah. which of course can lead to a lot of disagreements, especially with a topic as uh, contentious in some in some ways. I mean, you know, you put, you put five antinatalists in a room and you got five different opinions about antinatalism in that room. Um, so it, it was always, that was a, always a big tension, I think, in the podcast. So the fact it ended up with just one person running the show, it's not surprising. Right, yeah. Yeah, so um, most of the original crew left at some point. And could you tell us a bit more about uh, about that, about your reasons for, first of all, for staying with uh, exploring antinatalism longer than most, and then for eventually leaving the project? I feel like that could be a whole podcast episode right there. Um, Glad we're recording one right now. <laughs> there, there's a, okay. So yeah, we, we, we released a few episodes and then I remember um, 
a particular episode coming out, which created a lot of controversy. And I remember waking up, checking my phone and getting a ton of messages and notifications, very, like people were very upset. And I was like, okay, let me have my morning coffee and figure this out. But because I was taking like longer than a few minutes, uh, people wanted decisions made like right away. Uh, so I, yeah, I, rem I remember holding like a group meeting and just trying to figure out how we're going to, where it went, where it went wrong and what, what are we going to do and what decisions are to be made. And um, I think eventually I, was, I got to the point where, because for a little bit of context um, and, and my Anton Ellis journey, um, I did something that was not advisable when it came to like, say, animal rights activism or any political or social, social advocacy or activism. I released my full name um, because I came through the academic route and I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an anti-natalist. Uh, this is a respectable position. And why should I hide my my identity? So I, I, I mm -hmm. talked about it openly and I got interviewed by um, not a great uh, website. I think it's called like the Daily Mail or something like that. But I was like, you know, and that that had I had some issues about uh, going on there. Um, but like this, uh, this, this was my like my name and my face was out there. And uh, I did not uh, think about platforming. I think like I, I hold a principle of being able to for a freedom of inquiry, but that doesn't necessarily mean free reign of platforming. I think there needs to be responsible platforming. And what that means to particularly to a group of people, the group of anti-natalists is definitely gonna differ. And I think that's a conversation we needed to have when you when you platform someone um and certain people have their professional and their personal lives associated and connected to what you're platforming um and and it's no it's not hidden where people are there are some and i, I i'm hoping it's a minority and i'm pretty sure that that advocate or or at least support the proposition that in certain situations that uh, harming uh, a pregnant woman or or um other you know uh, things like that uh, is ethical and and the thing is i understand some people who are like well you know they, they argue the argument and it's like fine but you have to understand that you're putting other people's credibility and their associations and their um out there and 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 it's kind of reckless uh to do that irresponsibly and we didn't really um navigate that or discuss it uh prior to that because honestly i was again i came through the academic route and i think if you listen to the first few episodes is it was more like philosophical meanderings and i that's the that's what i was i wasn't expecting certain things like that to happen um and how to how to like uh, navigate it and how to manage it too because i was like i don't want to make the decision for everybody i think that we should all come to an agreement and i think uh that's hard too when you have a lot of cooks in the kitchen so uh which episode are we talking about it must have been quite early on uh, oh right yeah so like um sorry if uh, being vague there so like uh, I forgot the number of the episode, but it was with a um, a YouTuber uh, that uh, old fan interviewed named uh, Gary Inmentum, and he's created this ideology called Ephilism, which there's a lot of Ephilists, or actually, I don't know if it's a lot. I think that the, the Ephilists within the anti-nihilism space um, may be a minority, but they're quite a vocal minority, and uh, some of the, some or, yeah, a lot of... Uh, yeah, some of the things that he has espoused in his in that interview, and also in general in his in his uh, his own YouTube channel, is quite uh, like a, it's it's quite objectionable. Um, and actually, when you associate or tie yourself in there, um, you know it, it makes uh, it, it complicates things. And uh, so, a lot of people um, left. And and actually, it was, it, people from the team. It wasn't just people from the team. It, it, I remember uh, some YouTube content creators when it was released also left anti-nihilism because of this. And also uh, it, it was the the spark to um, uh, that brought down the uh, rogue philosophy uh, discord server. So um, this had, this had quite an impact and uh, non <laughs> as a non-consequentialist, I was like, what, what does this mean? You know, like this is something that is not conducive to, a social cohesion within a community that wants to build a community. Uh, but at the same time, um, this is the consequence of it. And also what is my personal views and, and how is it affecting other people's views? And uh, I, I'd like to hear Carlos's mm -hmm. perspective during that time too, about like, uh, and if, sorry if I'm all over the place, uh, it, it was a few. Yeah, it's no. fine. It was very emotional times. 
yeah, yeah. there were very emotional times. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think my um, personal experience with that episodes, and I mean the antenatalist, that specific episode in the podcast, but also the episode in general for the community and what it meant was that we were blindsided by it. Uh, it was, I mean, it, it was recorded sort of in secret and then published in secret instead of being like a communal thing that everybody should have been part of. Because uh, I remember I wanted to, I remember I wanted to challenge Gary on quite a few things, but then, you know, his it's biggest fan. Kind of like adds like a type of, um, uh, like we didn't even have a rule about that, you know, like. We yeah, we didn't have a rule. Yeah. So, so yeah. So for me to say the rules were broken, they were not broken, but let's say the, the way we had done things previously was broken. Right, right. Um, the sort of silent agreement on how things were done. And, you know, no, none of us got to challenge Gary. So that episode was just, uh, you know, an interviewer just pretty much agreeing with everything the 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 guest was saying and uh there's no pushback and it just it just cast the episode i mean the the, the whole project as an affilist project and people didn't want to be associated with that yeah and um and that and that was it and you know if 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 that's something that could have happened once it could have happened twice and who knows where it would have gone uh I mean, now, now that we look back and I think Exploring Antinism is up to what, 89 episodes or something like that. Um, that was, I mean, if you look at the whole project, the whole project is great. It, yeah. And it had like, you know, a few bad apples in terms of episodes. That's one of them. But at the time, because it was so new, it, that one bad apple was a big percentage of the whole thing, um, which which made it very scary for me to be involved in. Um, mm-hmm. not, not that I think, um, I mean, cause I think some ideas, uh, have merit enough to be discussed, but don't have merit enough to be platformed, especially on a medium like the internet where people, where, you know, people who might be vulnerable or people who might be very easily influenced can listen to those ideas. And then, you know, who knows what they're going to do afterwards. Uh, so yeah, so that, that was my experience and, and, it, it, and, you know, that's related to aphilism, but on a broader level with the podcast, it just made me feel like it wasn't a team effort. It was sort of a, you know, um, you know, like an individual project and people just kind of came in and used it. So it, it didn't feel like something I wanted to be involved in. Yeah, that's fair. And I want to apologize for a lot of the, to the team and, and how I uh, manage that. Cause I had no experience of managing a project like that. And then I was just going in blind and just figure it out. We could all try to figure it out in some way. Um, so I was I was sad when a lot of people left, um, but I, I also acknowledge uh, my role in that too. So yeah. But uh, speaking about not wanting to be associated with um, certain beliefs and certain people, perhaps, um, Mark, you um, stayed on the show for quite a while. And uh, even on your own YouTube channel, you um, hosted discussions with, uh, with ethelists and with promoterlists even. So um, can we talk about that uh, a bit more? Like, what is your um, your approach um, to this? Uh, you mentioned your principle of uh, of freedom, and uh, it looks like you also had to deal with a bit of backlash from from the community. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. I um, I think I stayed on. I, I can't remember exactly. I think I stayed on for a couple of episodes, but eventually I did leave for a few months um, because I just couldn't. Um, like I, I wanted to focus on creation ethics, and this, uh, this ethelism ideology kept seeping in and kept causing uh, problems and drama. And I'm like, this isn't even like an academic philosophy thing. And I'm, it's just, I'm, my I'm energy is getting like swayed into something that I never even signed up for. So I, I needed space to uh, collect myself, and also, you know, the emotional stuff that happened. Of like, it wasn't just people didn't want to continue with the project. Like people deleted their channels and left. And, um, you know, people lost, uh, yeah, those connections. And um, that was pretty sad. And uh, so like need time from that f- for that. And then um, also evaluating uh, like my personal platforming um, views, which is not exactly solid. And I'm still wrestling with that. Um, as you said, I've, I've hosted pretty much like I think the majority of my channel, or, or there's a lot of content there of people that I absolutely oppose, um, and that. But the thing is, I've kind of for now. Um, at the start of a lot of, the, of those videos, you will hear me warn the audience and also state my position. Um, and this is more of a of letting letting them because there's there's one thing for me to say what their ideology is, but it's another for them to 
and and I'm not just talking about athletes, but pro mortalists and uh, you name it, whatever, like someone who's into eugenics or, or, or forced sterilize, name it, like whatever. It's bet in my view, and this isn't some type of manipulation or trickery. If that's your true belief and you're part of this space, then I want people, like, I think it's, it's a value for people to know that and, and what type of space they're entering into um, instead of just like taking my word for it. So let, let, let people in the space say what they believe honestly and in good faith. And it turns out, honestly, some people advocated support this type of stuff and people should be made aware of it. And I feel like um, as long as I can do that in good faith, like I'm not trying to trick anybody or manipulate anybody and I'm trying to like not mince their words. I'm just like, hey, this is, this is, this is your time to share your honest beliefs. Go for it, say it. And they say it. I'm like, well, so now whenever it was like, oh no, Mark, you know, that doesn't exist in antinatalism. Well, you're wrong. Here's evidence, you know. So that's uh, that's kind of been my my thing now, or or at the time uh, when that happened, when like I was creating content because it's been a while. It's been maybe a year or something like that. Um, always had this. If we talk about the the ethics of platforming and holding interviews, I've always been inspired by this guy named Louis Thoreau. Are any of you familiar with him? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I live in the UK, so <laughs> he's been on television quite a lot. So what I he's a documentary is... maker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love like his style and I was really inspired by it because what a lot of journalists will do is like have a like what they'll do the interview and then they'll push back and that's usually the the go-to thing but with Louis Thoreau he, he gets really personal and get not not too personal he's like um he offers a friendly uh or cordial way of letting people express their views while also saying you do know that this is kind of crazy right <laughs> and uh i really liked that that style of um shedding light onto some topics and it's kind of just the way that i've always seen it um and i again i'm open to the idea i could be wrong here but i like making the darkness visible for um some of these uh ideas out there and um this has been my method and continues to be a little bit my method like i i haven't really changed i, I do believe in responsible platforming um mm -hmm. Not again, not just saying, hey, here's my channel, say what you want, and I'm not going to say anything. Like, I'm not, I'm not like that, but uh, th this is the type of method that I try to, you know, work with. Yeah, and I do think that, oh, sorry, say this again. What do you, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think that's uh, um, definitely a respectable um, uh, attitude towards that, but it seems not everyone uh, agrees with this. And Right, the backlash, right? <laughs> yeah, because... Yeah, so there was at one point even some sort of um, documentary was uh, produced uh, on this uh, and it said sadly many antinatalists enable him that is uh, gary and his followers and further destroy antinatalism's chances at becoming more popular mark maharaj is a particularly egregious example he platforms effortless and adds legitimacy to them all the while distancing himself from their views would he do the same with nazis would you so here's the thing People who have made these anti ethelist videos and documentaries used my content. <laughs> and um, the uh, I so here emotionally, I totally understand where they were coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I do see ethelism as a toxic element within antinatalism, but that we unfortunately share this space. And I don't want to hide the fact that these uh, toxic elements uh, or ideologies exist, because I think, again, if I just make a no name video just saying, here's all the bad things it just comes across like you're a troll. But like, if I could actually, like I, I held an ethelism panel and spoke to some of the leading ethelists or advocates. And in preparation for that, I privately interviewed Gary as well. And I don't think many people who are opposed to an ideology um, and are willing to investigate an ideology is, is really willing to go to those, those levels. Um, and uh, so, like, would I investigate and and would I do a little bit of research and platform and talk to people that I believe like are Nazis and stuff like that? Yes, I would. And but that doesn't mean that I'm going to. I don't want to do it irresponsibly. Um, mm -hmm. I, I got a little triggered when you were like, "This you have a liberal view of platforming," because it reminds me of like the Dave Rubin stuff and uh, certain right wing, uh, or I, I don't know if I would call it right wing, but like certain people who are just yeah, like platform anybody and everything. I think the way that you do it definitely um, matters. And yeah, I got blowback from <laughs> all, it's not just 
Ephilus and anti Ephilus or anti Nihilus. It's, it's, it's like a whole whole spectrum and different things. Because like another thing people said was you're on the fence. I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I've always been like open about my views. I don't know what fence you're talking about. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, it's interesting for people to use my material exposing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, it was not intentional, but it was like, yeah, here are things that they have said and believe, um, while also uh, putting down the person who produced, like who who went to get that material as well. Um, it, it was a weird thing for like my own side, so to speak, to uh, uh, come after me. Um, but I understand their motivations because like I agree with them um, about the toxic elements. But uh, nobody came to me to like even have a chat about it. And it was just like, screw you, Mark. And I'm like, all right, well, thanks. You want to <laughs> like, all right. Um, yeah. What I would like to um, point out is you just mentioned like uh, identifying certain toxic um, elements. And there are probably various types of responses uh, you can have to uh, and, and yeah, to, to identifying um, a problem like this. And of course, you can go on some sort of uh, crusade or campaign. I think that's uh, one reaction one can have. One can also try not to, you know, give any sort of legitimacy or attention, even if it is negative attention to, to the whole thing and, you know, just uh, stay quiet about it and uh, stay silent. We have seen people uh, leaving uh, the scene, which I can totally understand. Of course, it's 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 very very unfortunate, but it is uh, totally understandable that they don't want to be have any sort of associations like this. But I also think that it is possible to um, uh, keep engaging on on a on a certain level, on a certain uh, level with uh, with certain rules, and uh, so so. I do think that uh, what you're doing is uh, is quite important, actually, and you know keeps. I think keeping the doors open with all these things in mind um, uh, might even be um, not sure if it's a it's necessarily preferable or, or better, but it, like burning bridges uh, doesn't have to be the only response to to that kind of uh, uh, problem. I think uh, you know having these sort of open-minded. Um, and but also responsible discussions, I think, can uh, contribute to to you know f fostering a, a healthy discussion climate. Yeah. To be fair, the 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 pushback you get is exactly the same pushback Louis Theroux gets. <laughs> yeah. But I do want to be held accountable and concede that yes, I was a philosophical useful idiot, and I I acknowledge that and I regret that. So like, um, I definitely want to like be held accountable and admit my wrongs there. So, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I understand the motivations and I understand the criticisms um and yeah like I'm 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 not trying to like uh yeah hide away from some of my wrongs in that regard too. So so by that I mean that in terms of like adding validity to an ideology it was apparent that I was so whenever I talk to someone that I disagree with I try my best to steal man or to apply a principle of charity and I've come to realize that sometimes that can make you um a useful uh person to bolster bullshit um and so like if someone's presenting what appears to be a very weak argument and you try your best to um tweak it out and actually build it up for them you, you kind of just do the theoretical groundwork for them when they didn't even present that to begin with and i think mm -hmm. that <laughs> um i wish i was more aware of that and i wish i was more like this is something that i would suggest regardless of this particular topic just in general um to be able to identify things that, you know, someone's presenting their argument and, and it, there might be one or two, like some things that there is something there of substance and you, you can engage with that and, and try to your best, but some things are just groundless. They're weak. And, and, and when you try so hard, you, they, they're like, yeah, that's what I believe. Now that you presented like a more stronger view um, that they may not have agreed with to begin to even begin with, but because you were trying your best, which a lot of you'll find more strong views and uh, theoretical explanations of this particular ideology from the critics. And, and people have said that, that are more philosophically inclined. Um, like uh, there's like a playlist with, with, with that as well. And for that, I think um, I definitely added uh, legitimacy where there was, where there shouldn't have been uh, to begin with. Yeah. I, I hope that, does that make sense? Did that make? Yeah, it does. And um, also one thing, um, that, would, that I would like to to add is that a lot of people, you know, who might be in a uh, 
a bit of a troubled, uh, find themselves in a troubled or vulnerable state, um, or simply haven't come into contact with any sort of philosophy before. And then they find these fringe positions and they find that they totally make sense and seem to align with their values and are very quick to apply these labels to themselves and to their own beliefs without having like fully fully understood what they what they stand for and i think that the fact that this happens quite a lot is also a good reason to to keep engaging in these spheres um to show people hey look there are certain problems with it you don't have to give up you know the entirety of your values and beliefs um it's just that you may want to look for better alternatives and, and and this could come across as uh, like a big dump on a lot of people that have contributed to the space. And I want to want to add to to just like, as I give credit to the team for uh, the contributions, a lot of um, a lot of people that I am ideologically in opposition and I consider them ideological enemies uh, have uh, you know contributed um, of things of value within the space. So that makes it. I don't have a solution, but I think uh, like. I just want to say like the, the positives and the negatives are there. It's not just, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just the negatives. Yeah. It's not just black and white. It's not black and white and it is more complicated than, than it appears. Yeah. And also people have changed their minds in the, in the last few years, you know, as, as since they, let's say their rise to prominence in the antinatalist community and where they are now, they have changed their minds. Yeah. We have seen it. Absolutely. Which further complicates things because, uh, uh, when you have like the written word or the recorded video or the recorded podcasts, you know, um, if you're analyzing those things, you always tend to assume those those things are eternal. You know, this person mm -hmm. thinks this forever, right? Instead yeah. of it being like a, a, a dialectical thing where it just keeps, you know, changing and people, people do change and they have different, not just in their thinking, but also in their life experiences and all the things they come into contact with. Um and, uh, you know, there's there's also that, this tendency to just kind of freeze people's opinions in times and our opinion of 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 them and where they're coming from. And uh, yeah, it's very complicated because, as you said, a lot of the mm -hmm. best contributions to this space in the community have come from people who have also very good opinions and then very bad ones as well. But that yeah. that that kind of exists everywhere, and, and veganism as well, for example. Yeah, yeah, and 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 that's a really important point, and I want to like second it with the timing thing because people could find things from maybe two, three years ago that I don't believe now, and also the people that I, I know for a fact, like some some of my critics at the time, like they, I wouldn't call them friends, but we are now cordial and in conversation because they understand the complex nature of engaging in this space, uh, and yeah, so so like some of the people that went hard on me um, are also like talking to me and and. Uh, Again, we're, I, don't, I wouldn't consider us friends, but they, they're like, I understand like some of the, the comp complexity of uh, of engaging in this space. And um, yeah, so so things have changed. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, that's not everybody. Obviously, some people double down and they hate me, but that's okay. So in your um, experience, you've been, you talked to me about like people with this, uh, yeah, black and white thinking levied to you. And I was curious, like, what, what was your experience like? Because, yeah. So, well, I do find your your principle of uh, what you called intellectual freedom. I find it quite admirable, and I like I try to reserve the right to criticize and openly uh, and sometimes sharply criticize um, things said or done by people who I really like. And likewise, I also reserve the right to appreciate by people who. I don't like or people who do things I consider very bad or perhaps even evil and I might I might even have uh, like a, a no, an overall negative image of someone or even a very negative image of someone but I still reserve the right to say well this contribution might might be anything might be just a uh, might be a piece of art or might be uh, if you take a look at my my music collection there are a lot of uh, creations by people who I think are genuinely bad or evil people but nonetheless um I'm able to appreciate their creations for what they are. And um, I, I think that uh, this is something where perhaps not everyone would draw uh, the line where I draw it. And I'm, I'm not sure if, if uh, m my possession, position is the morally correct one on this. Um, uh, it's just that uh, things can get very complex and it's very difficult to uh, c 
kind of kind of agree on on universals in, in this case. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. And Carlos, like, could you push back on me? Because like I remember, like you would be a person who would disagree with me on like, um, well, maybe you wouldn't. Like, if I was to uh, talk to a Nazi and then offer like pushback as well, like, what would your view be on that? Uh, well, I I would say the same thing. He talks to a lot of Nazis and kind of you know. People might not be Nazis, but are let's say white supremacists, but not maybe share the full Nazi right. thing. Right. Uh, he does a lot of work in in kind of getting friendly with all kinds of people and having them say things they maybe don't want to say in public, and that's important. Uh, exposing power levels, as it's called, on the internet, isn't it? Um, and I think you're doing some of that too, and and you do push back. Um, I, I, I'm just afraid. I mean, because of these are really fringe things. I mean, like. You know, ethelism is is much more fringe than much, 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 much more fringe than say being a white supremacist, right? right. right? I mean, white supremacy you can you read about it in school. Uh, well, I hope you do in these days. Um, so everybody kind of knows what it is, and 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 racism and kind of anti semitism and so on. Um, so when you say, well, when you kind of platform white supremacy, uh, so kind of expose people who are but might not say in public usually that they are, or might be hiding that they are. I think it's doing a good thing. Whereas with ethelism, I think you run the risk of just bringing something to the knowledge of other people that they will have, you know, not in a million years they would have heard about it. Uh, although to be fair, considering the space you operate in, people might come and come across that word sooner or later, right? It's yeah, not like your podcast. Mm -hmm. It's not like a podcast about that, uh, veganism and your, sorry, your shows about uh, in the, uh, your contents about veganism and then you're bringing in ethelists. Um, so yeah. I mean, it's not like you're doing a cooking show and then saying, "Well, we got the Nephilim." Do you want to talk about? <laughs> do you want to talk about what you should do about uh, uh, sentient beings? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, in that, in that sense, I think, I, 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 if you're comfortable with what you do, and and I I'm think not it's for the record, I'm not comfortable. Okay. Well, I, I, I wouldn't do it if like I were you. Pushing my, like I'm, I'm exploring my boundaries myself, and I wrestle with it, and I know that like my pushback, I think, has progressed over the years as well. Uh, because yeah, I'm, I'm like, uh, it's still something like I'm I'm trying to figure out as well. So and it, it I, depends, it's not just the like one, this 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 one issue. Like it go, it goes for like transphobia, it goes for misogyny, or it goes for um, mm -hmm. the uh, access to abortion. Like you can name it. Like it, it just extends to a lot of different uh, issues as well. Uh, well, my view, the things I want to do with my time, in this case, kind of unpaid or paid work, it doesn't really matter. I would not give those people the time of day or uh, any kind of exposure. Gotcha. That's I mean, that. That's what I want to do with my time and with my energy. I wake up with a certain amount of energy I can spend on a, on a day. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, the bit of rest sometimes, not often, but some some rest. And I want to I want to focus on things which I believe should exist in the world. Oh yeah, more of. Yeah. To be fair, like I, I I don't run like a channel uh, where. I'm harping on this. It's uh, the reason why my FOs and panel was, I think it was like three and a half hours long or something like that is because I put in so much work to close. I was like, I'm done with this. Um, I don't like, I want to focus on the the philosophies that's, you know, actually uh, you know, I find interesting and bring me joy in life, even though the topics that do bring me joy in life are like pessimistic philosophy, but. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as I, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, with Carlos and, I, and anyway, I try to stay away from uh, from the internet and, and social media these days. And when I'm dealing with philosophy, I usually make sure that it is uh, something worth engaging with. Like, why should I watch uh, this or that five hour conversation when I could in the same time read a bit of Schopenhauer or read a bit of this exactly. or that, uh, yeah. you know? And uh, but nonetheless, I think like uh it is also important to 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 keep in mind that by uh, not engaging and uh perhaps even leaving certain spheres you are also kind of leaving the entire stage to kind of the, the faction that you are opposed to and um as much as i understand uh like this desire not to have to want to have anything to do with it um i also think that it is um good perhaps not like uh, morally uh, mandatory, but it is certainly good to have um, a couple of, uh, you know, opposing voices, uh, people who oppose this um, position in these in these spaces who keep engaging with it, but uh, take a, um, a perhaps we would say a more reasonable 
um, approach and position. And oh. I do think that these people make very important contributions. Yeah, yeah. That actually, I didn't answer your question about like why I left and why I came back. That that that's why I came back mm -hmm. is because um, I was like, okay, it's. I think it's important to at least have a second voice heard yeah. uh, within the show, and um, and and be able to do that. Now I did retire because eventually, like, at some point, I can't be like I'm going to do this forever. I, I know, I know certain people like that's that's their passion, that's their life. They're going to do that forever. But for me, I'm like, mm -hmm. I needed like for me to be comfortable. I was like, I needed to offer an alternative way of looking at uh, at things, uh, and I did that for two years. And, and I'm not saying my way is the only way. I was just saying that here's an, here's a different way of looking at it. And uh, I I feel like that's why I was drawn to to come back as well. Um, to, so that it wasn't just like one particular view uh, as well, mm -hmm. even though, you know, it, the show itself is exploring different views. But um, yeah, I thought uh, contributing to a little bit would have helped. I don't know if it helped, but that, that was my motivation. So I certainly felt that your perspective uh, that you brought into the discussion was very, very valuable and, uh, you know, is dearly missed uh, after uh, after you left. Thanks. Thanks. And I mean, for example, uh, now it kind of just uh, struck me that, uh, for example, the, the small but significant intersection between antinatalism and veganism or antinatalism and animal rights. I think that, that this is, for example, is a field that um, should not be left completely to, uh, to, to, to the ethicists, for example. And that's why I think it is particularly important to have um, uh, so-called sentiocentric antinatalists, uh, agent uh, uh, relative, perhaps, um, who like do consider animals even under antinatalism without the whole baggage attached to it um, that you find in in effortless spaces. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that because I, I probably would have forgot to bring that up. Because like uh, one thing that I try to like highlight is how does how does the pipeline even exist, and how did how did this division even begin? If you look at the internet history of it, is because of this uh, division with about sentiocentric and anthropocentric antinatalism. And while some of my critics have been hard on me about um, about like who I've platformed and, and worked with and stuff like that. And I, I agree with their, their like, I understand where their criticisms are coming from and their motivations and stuff like that. I would um, like to highlight that they filled a niche for a reason. Um, because in certain antinatalism spaces, even if the mention of other animals just mm -hmm. gets pushed away. And again, I don't know a solution to that because I understand why certain moderators do that. Because it could fall down a, a different path of antinatal or whatever you want to call like uh, antinatalism, but when you when you don't allow people to talk about animal ethics when when it relates to agents creating moral uh, moral patients or 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 uh, yeah, just bringing into existence other sentient creatures, like to where where do people go? And uh, I think that that's something that should be considered. Uh, again, I don't know the solution, but that's a consideration. Yeah. All right, uh, Mark, let's uh, move on a bit to your other projects. Uh, of course, you uh, used to be a co-host of uh, the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, but what can you tell us about your um, other projects? What are you doing at the moment? Yeah, so uh, another little niche that I like was uh, live streaming. And I don't know why I enjoy it, <laughs> but um, I watch some live streamers and I always wanted to see more uh, live streaming antinatalists. And currently, that's what I'm doing. Um, it's not intentional. It's just it, it, uh, like I, I, uh, I'm trying to work on um, promoting the philosophical pessimism Discord server uh, that Conundrum has. Um, I'm, there's like uh, some a book club in there, and they're like trying to help promote that and and be part of the book club. Uh, and so like, yeah, that, that discord server, the live streaming, um, I have some, I, I don't have polished video essays because that's a field that uh, video editing is quite a, quite a task, but mm -hmm. that's, um, I have some scripts and I'm working on some video essays, not related to antinatalism, but other like, uh, animal ethics and all this, like, uh, not just animal stuff, but, uh, uh, when it comes to bioethics and um, some of the topics I have covered uh, on my channel, um, I'd like to highlight more because I, I unintentionally focused maybe a little too much on the antinatalism stuff um, when I am interested in a wide variety of topics. It's just 
yeah, inadvertently my content uh, turned out this way. Um, so yeah, the, the Discord server and oh, <laughs> I don't really promote this and I don't know why I don't. Uh, I'm, I have a Facebook group called Academic Antinatalism Philosophy, and I try to share academic resources related to procreative ethics, and um, I try to keep it, uh, yeah, focus on the academic side to share resources, and um, hopefully a few people read the material. Uh, so I think those are yeah, my YouTube channel, the live streaming, the Discord server, the Facebook group. I think that's all I'm doing for now. Um, in my own personal life, I'm just like, trying to work on other personal goals as well. Okay, uh, really interesting. Of course, we're going to link uh, all your other projects, uh, if you like, in the video description as well. Um, but you mentioned that you have spent a lot of time in yeah engaging in the uh, yeah in the in antinatalist spheres or in the antinatalist scene, if there's such a thing. And we also wanted to talk about the lessons that you've learned and perhaps even the advice that you'd like to give to other internetalists perhaps listening to the show right now so, yeah, so um, oh, uh, what i say almost like like a mantra like uh, unsolicited, unsolicited uh, advice is read more and spend less time on the internet and one more thing don't give the this whole internetalism thing more space and energy than it actually deserves like don't be a full-time internetalist because internetalist burnout is very real and perhaps this is something that we can discuss Oh, right. Yeah. So in preparation of, of our discussion here, um, I listened to all your episodes and it came apparent to me that um, I have a very different experience within this space than um, other people. So what I'm about to say or suggest or to offer for consideration are just suggestions and considerations, not prescriptions, because everybody has their different you know experiences in this space. For example, one thing that... Um, that helps me with my particular goals of being able to uh, talk to um, people that I don't just disagree with, but actually oppose, is to be able to keep a, cer a certain distance. Um, so I know you guys are friends, and uh, one, one boundary I've made is not to be friends with anybody in this space. I think that might be a strong, <laughs> a very strong rule um, that I, I don't know if other people would adopt that, but um, this gives me space to criticize anyone and everyone because um, I have no ties to anybody. And I don't have to, like, if I have to, if I have to criticize you, Lenny or Carlos, I can do that freely without worrying about, uh, you know, the blow yeah, and you're, you're welcome to do so. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I try my best to be, and I probably fail sometimes, but I try my best to, to give a, a balanced and fair view as, as best as I can. Um, but I, I, I need like my, my principle is I need that freedom of inquiry more so than the connections that I build. Um, and I know that I'm probably in a minority there, but it's because mm -hmm. of my history of of growing up in environments where I wasn't encouraged to be able to question certain things and associate or talk to certain people or question certain ideologies or question certain, even talk to or question other things. And I found that very in, uh, stifling. And so now I want to to uh, be able to, to have that freedom to do that. And um, that doesn't mean I don't have friends. I have great friends. And um, I would suggest that, yeah, when it comes to the anti-natalism world, please have other interests if you can. Yeah. Um, because I do. I do have other interests. I have other groups that I'm part of. And I have great friends outside of this little world. And that keeps me, I, I think, a little bit grounded um, and, and, and and helpful for like, if, if things are going too nutty in this little world, then I'm like, well, I have, I have another area where I'm like, I, I can just put that out of my head for a few few you know some time and yeah having a diversity of uh of interests and and hobbies and and spaces that you engage with i think is is helpful um and uh when it comes to like things i've learned and advice um yeah so like with the a and burnout stuff um i definitely got burnt out and uh i think that is if, if you become a content creator or an activist or whatever, um, there are certain contributing factors. Like this, this is going to be very personal to the person, what, what is mentally taxing. Um, so that's going to vary. And then just to be mindful of what contributes to what is cognitively taxing for you and um, be aware that burnout is a thing uh, and to take you know self-care with, with that. Careful with the connections and networking that you participate yeah. in. But well, again, just... I'm not saying like, um, again, prescriptively, it's just, um, again, something to consider about uh, just because 
some people are, are are very nice doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to align with your values or your like if we all like um Carlos and I if we agree politically on certain things it doesn't or sorry if we agree philosophically on certain things doesn't mean that we agree politically on certain things um yeah. and so you know you want to take that to be mindful of that and the, so the connections you're making the networking that you're you're participating in and uh I would like to encourage people to be um there, there is a little bit of a, well, not a little bit, there's a literacy problem in capitalism yeah. spaces. Uh, Absolutely. I don't know if that could ever be fixed or not, because I think um, philosophy in general is not really engaged with. It's not a, um, but what I would say is uh, even if it comes across intimidating or something like that, or something that you just don't enjoy, I'd say get in the habit of reading things that you enjoy so that at least you're building a small little habit of uh, engaging with material. And you don't have, you have to go with books. You could just, Maybe read uh, some um, academic papers that are just a you know a few pages long, just to get your you know comfortable with uh, with with engaging with that type of material. And um, if you'd like to like simply start reading or get in the habit, feel free to reach out to to us, to Mark, to myself. Uh, we are more than happy to to assist you in that. And once again, I must uh, highlight. Uh, the excellent uh, book club on Conundrum's server where we discuss um, Schopenhauer, but also uh, more recently published academic papers on internatalism. I think this is a great opportunity to kind of get into the habit, exchange ideas and, um, you know, make it make it a bit less intimidating. And uh, once you've said this as a somewhat regular thing that you do, um, then I think that's also an, an extra incentive to you know finally sit down and and read something yeah and and conundrum is a perfect example of someone who's a harsh critic uh but someone that um has been very important uh to me in the anti-nihilism community um because yeah. he's also what whenever i've uh done something um that he disagrees with he's very open about that but then also when i do something good he's very supportive of that and i think uh, i don't want to come across as too much of a conundrum simp but um <laughs> Because we've definitely aren't, aren't had, we was that? Aren't we all? <laughs> uh, like we've definitely had uh, very frustrating conversations back and forth, but I kn like the I knew he was coming at it in a place of um, not like trying to take me down or anything like that. He was, yeah. it was uh, good faith uh, conversations that can sometimes be frustrating, um, but I appreciated his uh, and he does this to everybody, and and I appreciate his ability to to be an independent thinker, but also go after everybody, but also support everybody at the same time where he sees fit. And yeah, that's something that uh, I I, tr I would like to try to model myself. And, and I just want to say like, over the years, I appreciated yeah. uh, Carlos, your support and, and, and Conundrum, your support, um, and also the, the, the criticisms as well. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, and this is precisely why I think that uh, your and Conundrum's voices are so important uh, in these spaces because it's very rare to find um, like this good faith uh, approach even to some very problematic or even downright bad uh, ideas uh, but still people are always taking the time to you know to formulate criticism and um, you know to, to act in good faith not with the intention of uh, tearing down what others build up but um, you know making uh, productive and constructive contributions. I think this is extremely valuable and something that I wish we'd see more of, like constructive good faith uh, criticism. Yeah, and, and I'd like to add um, an unsolicited suggestion. Um, if you are, uh, if you do like a content creator or the stuff that they put out, even a little comment can um, really encourage that person or motivate the person. Because I, a lot of views, but it doesn't necessarily mean, because the sometimes the, neg the, the negative stuff uh, is more loud. Then the positive, uh, it's like this squeaky wheel gets the oil kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I just <laughs> encourage that if possible. Yeah. Um, be very careful about revealing your identity. <laughs> be like uh, another thing is, um, yeah, again, just be considerate and mindful of if when you are if you're going to do that, or um, you don't have to, and don't feel uh, like obligated, but just you know. Be be, uh, be 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 mindful of uh, if you do that, or I would say you don't have to. And yeah, just uh, that's another suggestion. Um, and have a healthy do dose of skepticism to everyone and I and your own ideas. So I try to be cordial to with everybody, but at the same time, don't trust me. Uh, and I would encourage people not to trust me. Uh, um, 
evaluate the arguments or my positions and anybody like Lenny, Carlos, name it. Um, you want to evaluate truth claims independent of the messenger. Check footnotes and check sources and pass the catch. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit of a footnote uh, nerd. I think this is very important and something that often gets a bit neglected neglected in, uh, in antenatalist discourse. A couple of weeks ago, when we were talking, you mentioned that you were doing some digital decluttering and I'd be interested in knowing what you what you meant by that and if this is something that you would also suggest to, to others. Okay, so I don't remember specifically that conversation, but I think at the time I was, um, it's very easy to, well, with my particular um, <laughs> uh, configuration of my brain, I get easily distracted. Uh, even, I think you probably could notice even in this conversation. Uh, so when it comes to, the the channels that I subscribe to, not just on YouTube, but like the uh, my RRS my RSS feed uh, when it comes to news articles or just all the information that we live in an information digital age, right? And you could spend all day consuming things that don't necessarily uh, align with where you want to go um, intellectually, or if you have goals of like trying to tackle a certain field and. So for me, sometimes I I want to solely focus on say um, normative ethics or normativity or meta ethics or uh, applied ethics or, or or if I want to take a political analysis of different um, different ways of looking at things like that's going to be my goal for the month. And if I'm having too much uh, uh, YouTube or TikTok or or whatever um, taking me away from those particular goals, then um, I try to uh, declutter. Uh, mm -hmm. digitally where where it leaves me an avenue where I can focus on the journey towards my goal. And then after that's accomplished or I feel like I've had enough of that particular topic, then I could realign my ship to sail to another section of the sea of information. Yeah, but because it's really a sea of information. And uh, as we said, in our, I think in our interview with John, uh, that you could basically spend your whole day consuming uh, antenatalism or, I don't know, veganism or whatever related content. And you're almost drowning in a flood of uh, of freshly produced content now. So I would like to know, are there any philosophers or any other content creators that you can wholeheartedly recommend? Oh, man, you're, you're, you're putting me in a position of favoritism. Um, <laughs> you guys. Uh, and okay, so before I do this, <laughs> my... The people that I may not mention is not that I don't think they have good content or anything like that. It's just for my particular, my very specific niche interest. It is in the um, academic, uh, more historical literary field. And there are certain people that tend to cover that more than other people. Um, and and so for the content creators that do sometimes, you know, on and off uh, produce that, that content, I want to say thank you. Um, but I understand not focusing solely on that because it, I mean, not a lot of people are into it, but uh, yeah. So uh, uh, I, I, I enjoy the, the, and like your content um, conundrums content uh, call me shibboleth uh, as well. And daily negativity, even though I very much oppose him ideologically and philosophically, I want to add that caveat in there. I'm very much opposed to daily, but uh, I do appreciate his analysis at the very least. Uh, like there's a philosophy overdose uh, channel that I, I like to subscribe to. And there's, I, I'm sure a lot of people in the philosophy sphere on YouTube, at least know of Kane B and he's uh, talked about antinatalism and I like the, uh, the stuff that he puts out. And one of my, uh, one podcast that I find interesting because I think they started the same time as exploring antinatalism. And uh, I remember connecting some of their guests from the guests that we had on is uh brain in a vat. I don't know if, People... Oh, yes. And they did an interview with, or several, with David Benetton. Yeah, ben, well, yeah, these, because yeah. I think it was one of them was a student, but also they had Travis Timmerman. They've had mm -hmm. uh, some other people that um, kind of cross paths with, uh, with the show. Um, and I, they have a different political leaning than I do, but, I, but that's someone that, uh, like, I like their, their show. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, so I, I also go on the, <laughs> the do not watch live streams, but that's not really... A, it's not really philosophy related, but they, they tackle topics like Gnosticism and stuff like that. So, um, and, and that's for now, I, 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 I'm probably missing something and, and I feel bad if I, if I'm missing anybody that I, I follow, because again, I'll, um, 
So my goal for like the next few weeks is to focus on certain projects. And then in two weeks, I'll resubscribe to people that, uh, that are in other areas too. So, but, but that's a taste of, uh, of, of what I, I follow. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Um, is there anything else that you would like to discuss on the show today? I just want to go back on the, because I have a featured section on my channel and, and I have you guys there, by the way. I, uh, oh, thank you very much. So I have, <laughs> um, so one person that used to engage in uh, anti-nihilism discussions was uh, Perspective Philosophy. I, 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 and he got me more interested in Hegel. Um, his content is much more Christian oriented these days. So, uh, but you know, he, he was a person that uh, I appreciated uh, engaging with and, and some of the content he produced. Um, the Voidcast, uh, and there's a Call Me Shibboleth conundrum, Philosophy Hub, Philosophy Overdose, k and Brandon Avat, um, and uh, I like the channel The Black Ponderer and Wireless Philosophy and Carnades.org. So those are just some extras. So yeah, anyway. If there's anything that you would definitely like to, to share with us or um, with our audience, then please, uh, the stage is yours. Yeah, so I, I, I'm back to another suggestion is like uplifting content creators that you like, but that might have smaller subscriber counts or smaller numbers uh, view counts. If there's something of value there, I think um, helping uplift each other is is a, is a useful uh, thing. And um, I'd also like, uh, I have reviewed a lot of your, uh, well, some of your episodes, and um, I, I enjoy the, the pop pop uh, culture stuff or the it's not really popular stuff it's it's movies and shows that i was not aware of so you've opened my eyes to some material um but i would uh, and again it's just a suggestion it's your show you do you do you uh but i do like um like it would have been cool to hear i, I appreciated your episode on emil torres book uh but i know they're they're like you could totally get an interview with them and I would, I would love to hear you interview Emil and more interviews. Um, and uh, I know Carlos is into like left-leaning, very, very left-leaning politics. A political analysis is like something that I'm craving. And I love when you talk about poetry and, and, and stuff like that. And um, just, I would encourage uh, more of that uh, in the history stuff. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I love when I'm, you're I'm, 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 I'm hiding my, my left-wing power level. <laughs> <laughs> I need I need a, a Louis Theroux to to draw out the my left wing power level. <laughs> well, Mark Mark could for, uh, perhaps fulfill this uh, this role. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I want to give a, a thank you because as 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 critical as I am about the space, um, there is a reason I keep uh, engaging with it. At times, I take breaks. I come back. I, there, there's value, and I, for the people that have been harsh critics and and supporters um i appreciate people who uh, have engaged with me in good faith um over the years and have helped me uh develop um and explore uh ideas and uh, help me um, open my eyes to uh to certain areas that I, I didn't even know i had um and and uh i'm really grateful for for a lot of the engagement i've had as as emotionally tough as it has been at times um i'm also very grateful and i want to thank everybody that has uh be it you're my my um we, we align with values or even the people that have uh, we are in opposition uh, i just want to thank everybody for uh the willingness to engage uh in conversation i appreciate that so thank you Excellent. and also thank you guys um as well i uh i really yeah. like your podcast and i hope uh i'm looking forward to more episodes in the future so kudos Thank you, Great. Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for being with us uh, today. It was a pleasure to to have you on and to have a little chat about very important uh, topics, I think. And yeah, would love to hear more from you. And I think on this note and in this spirit, we can close the episode and uh, thank everyone for, for listening. You are, of course, welcome to leave your comments and suggestions um, down below. You can send us an email. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. Thank and you. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye -bye.